Hey, this week on The Anxious Truth, we're going to talk about how to get unstuck when you're just stuck and desperate and think you have nowhere to go. How can you get unstuck? So let's get going. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is podcast episode number 209 recorded. I don't know when we're recording. It's April of 2022. I don't know when you're going to hear this. May, June, don't know. Anyway, welcome back to the podcast. If this is your first time here, I am Drew Linsalata, creator and host of The Anxious Truth. This is the podcast where we talk about all things anxiety, anxiety recovery. So if you're having problems with things like panic attacks or agoraphobia, this is the place for you. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. And if you are a returning listener or viewer on YouTube, what up, YouTube? Welcome back. Of course, I'm glad you're here. Today, we have a guest. I'm joined by my friend, Joe Ryan, who has been on the podcast before. You guys may recognize Joe. And we're going to go through a story of how Joe got unstuck. And so much of this stuff is going to sound familiar. I think it's it's just jam-packed with really useful information, practical information. It applies to everything we talk about recovery. But here's the beauty part. This is not beauty part. He's my friend, and I wish it wasn't true. But Joe comes from a trauma background. Joe has, has lived through a bunch of traumatic experiences. So for those of you who are dealing with past traumatic experiences and abuse in your past and also have an anxiety disorder, Joe's a good guy to listen to. And we really marry these together in this story of getting unstuck. I think you're going to really dig it. Before we get to the interview, which is really good, uh, I'm going to remind you that The Anxious Truth is more than just this podcast episode. If you go to my website at theanxioustruth.com, you will find three what I think are excellent books on anxiety and anxiety recovery. You will find my morning newsletter and podcast called The Anxious Morning. You should check that out. And links to all of my other podcast episodes, all of which are free, and all of my social media content. Everything is right there at theanxioustruth.com. And if you are liking this work and I'm helping you in some way and you want to find a way to help me keep it ad-free and sponsorship-free, all the ways to support the work are at theanxioustruth.com slash support. So go check that out if you are so inclined. Uh, never required, but always appreciated. So let us get on to the interview. I will bring Joe on, and then I'll come back at the end to wrap it up, give you all his links, how you can find him, and uh, I'll be back afterwards. Hope you enjoy this. All righty. Here he is, the one, the only, Joe Ryan. Welcome back. <laughs> hey, Drew. How are you? <laughs> We're from in front of your like comedy cellar brick wall. Dig it? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to see what's behind there. No. Nobody ever wants to see behind the scenes, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for coming back, man. We haven't done one of these in a really long time. And, and every time we do, everybody loves them. So I'm glad, I'm glad you're back. All right, good. Glad to be here, man. Yeah. So today, I, in, like I mentioned in the intro, we're going to talk about how you get unstuck because Joe's particular story of getting unstuck in this particular instance is, is exactly what you guys need to hear, like how he went through this. So let, let's set the whole thing up. You know, you, 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 where are you coming? Where are you right now? Where am I right now? I'm in New yeah. York City. My apartment. Where are you? In your apartment in New York City, right. So this is, yeah. remember this as Joe starts to tell the story. <laughs> so at the time that this story starts, you're out here on the island. You're living out here on the island. Correct. Okay. So, so go ahead, take it away. What happens? How do you get from living on the island and not doing so great to where you are now? Well, I was uh, basically bankrupt, homeless, divorced, um, just went through like a major tragedy. You know, I built this life up of a house and a business and everything, and it just kind of all collapsed. And I threw away 17 years of sobriety. I went back to what I knew, what was familiar. I was I was completely stuck. I could not go forward. I was sitting in shame. I was miserable. And being homeless, living in somebody's spare room, the life I went back to was no longer speaking to me. At some point, all addictions fail. And there was a part of me unconsciously that knew nothing outside of myself was going to bring me to a place that I wanted to be. Not a job, not money, not drugs, not women, not getting nothing. It just, I was stuck. I was on the couch and I was slowly becoming agoraphobic. I was afraid to go out. I was afraid to open up mail. Um, you know, the simplest chores like making coffee took like an hour and a half of mental preparation to walk eight feet and hit a button. And I just kept doing the same things I was doing, but I was miserable. I was going out a little bit here and there, and I was more miserable being out than I was being home and isolated. And I knew something had to change. I just didn't know how, you know, you spent 
your heart, entire life building up to this place and it all falls apart and you don't have a plan B. Yeah. So yeah. I was stuck. I mean, I, the way I like to call it, I was emotionally paralyzed. I couldn't move. I was sitting in uncomfortable feelings. I was fearful, um, just helpless. Yeah. And I wanted to make a change. Yeah. I remember those days you were, you were, you were just, in, I mean, it was hard. It was hard to see you back then because you were definitely in that just, it was almost despondent in a way is the word that I can describe. Yeah. I remember we met in that parking lot. We had to exchange something and you were looking at me and I go, dude, I don't think it's ever going to get any better than this. Yeah. And yeah, I, I truly take. believe that I didn't want to be here anymore. Um, so I remembered when I was a kid, I used to hang out in the city. I studied in the city. I loved Manhattan. It was the energy, the vibe. I felt alive in there. And I decided I wanted to go and I wanted to go in there, but I couldn't make it to my corner without like four hours of mental preparation and armoring up. And, you know, it, how are you going to put this helpless, codependent, agoraphobic child in the middle of the East Village and have him survive? So for nine months, I kept texting people and calling people, you know, tried to get somebody to go into the city with me because I felt like I couldn't handle it on my own. And after about nine months, nobody responded. Nobody wanted to go. And, you know, I kept trying to work my courage up to doing it. And one Thursday, I drove to the Huntington train station and the trains run every hour. And I sat there for four hours and I let four trains go by. And I turned around. I drove home completely defeated and, you know, sat in more shame and helplessness and panic for another six days and the next Thursday came, I drove to the train station again and I sat there and one train went by and then another train went by and I got on the third train and I was freaking out. I tried to mentally prepare for anything that may happen, any confrontations. I wanted to do it right. And, you know, just tried to manage the fear. And I kept thinking about the movie, What About Bob? Baby Steps on the Bus, Baby <laughs> Steps on the Bus. <laughs> <clears throat> so that hour-long train ride felt like a month and a half, just the terror and the panic and the unrest within my body. And we got to Penn Station. I got off the train. I walked upstairs. I walked around, and I walked right back down to Penn, and I got on the train, and I went home. Yeah. And there was something happened that that night when I got home I had found I'm getting emotional thinking about it I had found a smile somewhere inside that had been missing for about four years and I sat with that I laid in bed it was dark it was quiet and instead of fear there was joy and surprise and um hope you know, there was a sense of competency. Yeah. You know, that I hadn't felt in a long time. And, you know, as a grown man, okay, big deal. You got on a train and you got <laughs> went to the Every, city, you got on a train and came no, home. It's like big whoop, like, you yeah, know. <laughs> I, everybody listening right now completely relates to what you're talking about. So we get that in a big way. I want to go back for a second to, you know, you go to the Huntington train station. You know, we've all I've been there many times. You just wait five trains go by, you go home. And you when you go home, you say, Well, I sit in the shame and the failure. And in those in those days, like I was one of those people getting the text, Do you want to go into the city? Not having any idea why <laughs> you wanted me to go to the city with you, other than just you know, a social thing. When you know, yeah. you hit it in such a way that, like, well, yeah, it would be like a thing to do, you know, on a Thursday night, I guess. And, but you're not thinking about it because I had no idea why you wanted me to go into the city or I'm sure why nope. anybody else that you were asking. We didn't know why that you needed. Why did you need me to go? I didn't know. So I get well, the shame. You were hiding it. Nobody is allowed to see my neediness. When I feel needy, I go into shame. I go into self hate. Yeah. So I cover that up and I hide it and I don't let anybody know because I can't handle. It feels like giving away my power. Um, mm. it makes me feel helpless out of control and I just don't like it. Neediness from where I came from was met with serious adversity. 
So you learn not to have needs and wants and desires and to lean on people. So I wouldn't, I mean, we know each other forever. Yeah. You know, all my deep, dark, crazy shit, but I still wouldn't have let you or anybody yeah. else know that at the time. Yeah, no idea. But now let's fast forward to that first trip where, okay, you hop on the train. It's about an hour from Huntington to Penn through Jamaica. You know, you get on the train, you get to Penn, you walk upstairs, you walk around, you get back on the train, you go home, which seems like, well, that's not a trip to the city. But everybody listening, well, I hope some folks listening will understand when you say you found a smile there, that sense of competency. There's almost a, a little bit of superhero feeling that comes along with that when you yeah. do the thing that you were so afraid to do. There are a few moments after that where you just you feel like you can now conquer the world. Did you have that for a little bit? Yeah, I did. It felt amazing. It was, yeah. you know, I'm an emotional child. My emotional growth was stunted at an early age. And, you know, I'm an adult body, but emotionally I'm a child. And, you know, that somehow I adulted that little kid through the fear. And it was the coming together of the outer adult and the inner kid in a sense. And there was this feeling of accomplishment. Um, you know, I surprised and impressed myself, I guess, is what it was. And that feeling I still have today, it's addicting. When yeah. I get stuck and, you know, this, on a, you know, you're always going to get stuck. There's always going to be things that come up that are tough, tough to get through. And I tackle them in a different way now because I know the feeling on the other end is just incredible. When you can surprise and impress yourself and move through fear, it's almost like you look back and go, really? I was, yes. I was afraid of that? Seriously? I like, afraid of that. Yeah. yeah, I can't believe I said that. I've been stopping my life and stopping doing what I wanted to do because of what? Fear? Yeah. Seriously? There, there is something to be said for that. You know, before, you know, and, and my folks talk in terms of exposures, before the exposure, you're literally kind of, you know, you're cowering on the platform of the Long Island Railroad. And then oh. after the, you're literally like, you know, the end of Armageddon when they're just in slow motion walking down the runway and they just save the world and the music is playing. Yeah. Suddenly you're that at the end of the exposure. Like, yeah, like, yes, you walk in <laughs> slow mo out of the explosion and the music is playing and you're the hero. It's amazing. But, Anyway, so one trip into the city does not fix this problem. What happens no. from there? Yeah. So oh, then it was sitting with that good feeling and it, it, I wrote it for a couple of days and then it started to wane and the helplessness and the panic and the fear started to come back. So next Thursday, same thing. Got in the car, drove to the train station, got on the first train. So we're improving, right? We're taking these small little steps and we're just adding on a little more and more. Went into the city, got out, walked around for a little while, got myself something to eat, got back on the train, went back to Long Island and had that feeling, except it was greater. And it just kept building within me. And yeah. that feeling kept lasting days right through the weekend, about Monday or Tuesday. It was like back to helplessness. You're not impressing yourself. You're not moving forward. You're falling back into stuck. Next Thursday first train in, took my camera, went all the way up to Central Park, took pictures, got myself something to eat, went back home, just kept building more and more confidence as I kept walking through more and more fear. It is a literal, t now I understand you're dealing with a slightly different background than maybe some of the folks listening. And and, and I'm going to mention this at the end of the podcast also, but you can hear all of Joe's stuff at JoeRyan.com if you want to hear his background, but the mechanics were exactly the same. And this is one of the reasons for everybody that's listening, why when when you roll and say the Facebook group and you say, hey, I went to the mall for the first time in three years, I'm going to give you a big fist bump and then we're going to say, do it again. OK, now Ooh. do it again. And listen to the way Joe described that, like the, you know, the feeling waned. So if you do it once and then just sit there, it won't last. It was the, re the repetition over and over and over that that got you there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It was just keep practicing, keep exposing, keep building, pay attention to the feelings, start to see what when they came up, what the situations were, try to map that fear back to some experiences, why they're there and work through them. You know, I've been avoiding fear and uncomfortable feelings <laughs> probably yeah. since about DNA until up until that point, you know, yeah. okay. and the way through it is to feel it. And experience yeah. it and, you know, just not avoid 
and it's hard. It's painful. That nervous system goes off the charts. You're overwhelmed. You get that lightheaded, start sweating. You crawl into this emotional ball and you're just kind of in the fetus position going, please don't hurt me type yeah. of deal. Yeah. But you're, you're such a good example. And this story continues, by the way, this is clearly not the end of the story, but you're such a good example of somebody. And we talk about this all the time, like, oh, but I have trauma. It's different. But you're looking at a guy on screen, if you're watching or you're listening right now, that is almost a textbook example of how you deal with all of it, all of it, like the anxiety and the trauma. So when Joe talks about like, hey, I, you know, I can map some of that fear back to old experiences in, in the mechanics of an anxiety disorder, we tend not to talk about that. But if there is a traumatic background, that is part of the process and it all gets done together in, se in sequence, sometimes trauma, sometimes anxiety, sometimes both at the same time. Like you're looking at a guy who actually has lived this so and so well. So Thank at this you. point, now from the outside looking in as your friend, and you know, we work together, we've been friends for so long, all of a sudden you become a city dude. I'm, I literally watch <laughs> you become a city guy, like, uh, you know, and just couldn't wait for that Thursday night. It was just became almost an addiction, but in a good way, you know, uh, and yeah. starting to express. So like, this is where I'm happiest. This is, this is great. These are my favorite nights of the week. This is so important. So from can't leave the house, afraid to get on the train, to I can't wait to get back in there. So what happens from here? So I, in three years, I missed six Thursdays, either to vacation or illness. It was, I couldn't live without it. I would feel incredible from the time I got home Thursday night till about Monday or Tuesday. And then it was like, you know what? I need the energy. I need the vibe. I need to just go and be. And I ended up making friends here. I hang out downtown. I listen to music. I've started to build the life. So when I had my kids on the island, I'd be out there three and a half days. And the other three and a half days, I would start renting hotel rooms in the city. I would crash at friends' houses. I was in here every free moment I had. And I ended up building a life. And when the pandemic hit, prices of apartments went ridiculously low in the city. And you know, I had to have a conversation with my kids because they're everything and I didn't want them to feel abandoned or, you know, unloved. And my daughter was going away to college, so I wasn't going to see her anyway. And my son, you know, found his friends and found girls. And, you know, he looked at me and this just said, listen, I need to lean on my friends more. You did your job. I don't really plan on coming on weekends anymore. I'm going to be staying at my friend's house. I've seen you happy in two places. One is at the lake house and one is in the city. You should go and live your life and be happy. And that fucking kid, man, like I'm crying thinking about it. It was like so supportive and so loving and so caring that it made this easier. Yeah. And then it was the fear of, doing it, you know, like I'm codependent. I always need a safety net, making sure somebody's there to pick me up. And I knew once I came in here, that all of that was going to go away. And I had to stand on my own two feet and figure everything out that I've been avoiding forever. And I moved in and created a life. And I am the city guy. You can't, uh, it's really tough to get me off this island. <laughs> it's amazing. I, you know, as somebody, again, Joe and I are friends. So, you know, I get to watch this the transformation was incredible. Like from, mm -hmm. from afraid to go wanting to go, but afraid to go to living there now, like, you know, happy. That's clearly where you belong. And how many times we have that conversation? Like, dude, why are you not there? Clearly that is where you belong. And I think one of the things that this really illustrates, we talk about recovery as sort of a march from being driven by fear to being driven by what matters to you. What's, what are your values? What defines you? What is important to you? I cannot think of a story that illustrates this more. This story illustrates so many, so many great aspects of recovery. I am governed by fear and just trying to avoid my fear and, and soothe that to I am living a life based on what I actually value, what makes me feel good, what feeds my soul, all of those things. What a change. Tremendous. It, it, I don't even recognize myself, but I don't, I've never felt more like me. And, you know, so many things living here are fearful. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful city. It's a great city. It's, it's a tough city. It's pretty unforgiving at times. And I started to realize how many fears I did have. You know, I played a lot of sports when I was a kid and I've been wanting to play softball for about 20, 30 years. And, 
you know, the some of the the beautiful things about the story is when I first moved in here, one of the first things I did was join a softball league. Mm. I was terrified. I was afraid, you know, all those infancy needs came up. Are you going to be, you know, is it going to come back? Are you going to be half the player you are? Are you going to make a fool out of yourself? And I joined this team and I met this guy, Rob, and him and I have become best friends. We are so similar. It's like we've known each other our whole life. You know, I, I have a ton of friends downtown. I built a life on the foundation of me and not what I thought I should be and what people expect of me, like cutting everybody out and living here and fending for yourself and doing it on your own. You really truly find out who you are, what you like, what you're made of, what you'll accept and what you will not. And it's going through that fear. And I've made some great friendships here. I have a great life now. I'm very happy to be here. And it's just building on that. It's not enough. Yeah. You know, I, I feel like there's, I could be so much more than I am. And there's still fear that stands in front of me, but that was a huge hurdle. And I basically taught myself that I'm stronger than my fears. I just have to keep chipping away at them. And eventually the fears become confidence. Yeah, there, there you go. I, we can might as well drop the mic right now. That's it. <laughs> that we can't do any better than that. This, that's a worth price mission. The price of a mission right there, people. I think, you know, the and the moral of the story here is how do you get unstuck from being stuck, glued, mired, concrete? You're in cement shoes, dude, in the worst. I saw it. And it was just one step at a time. It wasn't, you know, on Friday, I was stuck in the concrete. And on Sunday, I was living my best life. It, it took a while. And I, I, I watched you take one step, then another step, then another one, another one, then more and more and bigger steps. And, and I think it's important to recognize, too, that you spent two years or whatever it was, every spare moment of your time was in the city. Clearly, it was where you were happy. You were practically yeah. living there anyway. Yet, when it came time to actually move, there was still more fear. It's, it's not like the fear just nothing's ever, there's no anxiety anymore, nothing's ever, there's no apprehension, there's no fear. Of course there is, because that's life. Right. And that's the thing is once, for me, once I conquered a lot of the bigger fears, the fears that come up, yeah, they're debilitating at times. Yeah, I can tendency to crawl up in a ball every once in a while when they're overwhelming. But it's not that cowering away from it. It is, okay, this is overwhelming. I'm not sure how to move forward with this. Some of this is just time and getting my nervous system, my body used to leaning into it instead mm -hmm. of pulling away from it. And you work through it. You expose yourself and it, it's overwhelming and you retreat a little bit. And then you recapture your energy and you recharge. And then you come at it just a little bit more. And you, to, even if it's a couple of inches. And that's the thing. It's patience, which I have zero, typically. <laughs> like, I want to feel I'm an addict. I want to feel good right now. Don't tell me yeah. this is a four-year plan because I'm not signing up for that. But it is managing expectations looking at what you have done and not far you have to go. If I look at the top of the mountain, I'm not getting off the couch. If I tell myself, I just need to climb up 10 steps and it's too windy, it's too cold on that cliff, I'm going to come back those 10 steps to base camp. I'm going to recharge and then I'm going to go 20 steps. And eventually you get to a point where you build a base camp higher up on that mountain. And you keep going up a little bit. You come back until you feel safe and confident within the fears. And then you move more and then you build another base camp and you just keep climbing one step at a time. If you told me you had to manage all your fears and be in the city today, if this was four years ago, yeah. I would have never done it. If it was just get on the train, bro, <laughs> like that's all I need you to do today. All right. Just get, so, yeah. Which is exactly what you did. So it's, it's learning how to parent yourself. It's learning how to discipline that little child that runs amok in you and say, listen, you need to put your fears away for an hour while I take care of this. You can be fearful and I will experience it with you, but we're going to get through this and I'm going to take care of it for a little while. And then we're going to manage it together. And eventually those two start to, to join. So it's not these big gaps of this paralyzing fear where I can't move forward. It is fear comes up and it's like, I can move forward. Maybe not today, but.
but let's just start working towards it. Let's identify it and let's work through it a little at a time. And who knows how long it takes. Some, for me, there's a light bulb that goes on and goes, oh my God, that was it. That was the fear. Really? This is what I was worried about? Yeah. And sometimes that comes quick. And other times it is like walking through cement. It's just so painful and so difficult. And those minutes feel like years. But if you don't do it, it's just, you know, nobody's going to knock on the door and go, hey, your fears take it away. Come on, start living. True. You True. have to live the life you want. Figure out what kind of life you want to live and start slowly working towards it. Yeah, in the end, that's what it is. I mean, we build exposures, which are artificial ways to trigger the fear. And that's fine because we have to practice. But in the end, we are really moving away from fear and toward what we value, toward what we really want in life. That is the recovery process in the end. Um, and I think that's great. And so what I love about this is not that there's no more fear, but do you find that there's two things I think to bring up? Number one, all the previous experiences become additive. So every time you slog through the cement, you get a little bit more confidence and competency for the next time that you have to slog through cement. I, I Absolutely. Think. Yeah. It's every fear that I, I feel like every fear that I work through is just another building block of the foundation of me. So if I go through this fear, whatever the fear is, and I no longer have to fear it, I am standing taller. I am feeling more confident, more secure in myself because I've handled it. So when it comes up again, sometimes it's not even triggering. Sometimes it's just like, oh, yeah, remember when we used to be afraid of that? Not anymore. Other Changes, times, man. yeah, but other, and other times it will bring you back. Like you'll get that twinge like, oh, shit. Yeah. And it's like, wow, I haven't felt that feeling in a while. Where did that? Co oh, I remember that now. Yeah, we're good. We worked through that. Let's just manage this feelings for a few minutes. And next time it comes up, we're going to be more aware. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. And I think, you know, that, so those additive experiences and building of that confidence and that ability and understanding like, oh, I'm capable of all this. It really gets to the point where it moves the fear. We always talk about, you know, disordered anxiety versus regular, like regular anxiety. It's disordered fear versus regular fear. Like everybody has fear and anxiety in their lives. And Joe's experience moves it from a disordered place or an unhealthy place into like more of a healthy, like everybody experiences fear and we have to, we find healthy ways to deal with it. Like I've just watched you learn to build healthy ways to deal with fear. So it's amazing. Yeah, when, uh, you know, and part of this for me, I mean, I'm more trauma based than anxiety based, even though I have a ton of both. Um, so a lot, you know, my fears, I like to map back to experiences. And that's the thing. I don't know. I just feel fear and panic in my body and I'm not sure why it's there. So I have to really tell myself, look around right now. There is nothing in your present moment that is dangerous mm -hmm. at all whatsoever. Why do I feel like I have a gun to my head at this moment? And for me, a lot of it is just past experiences, you know, you know, the abuse and the, the fear and living in in terror a lot growing up, that something will trigger me and take me back to this little boy. So the fear for me comes from being emotionally stuck. And that fear hit when I was a kid. There was no way of managing it for me. There was no way of understanding it. There was no way of processing it. So I actually like, I don't like, <laughs> I, I need to go back to feel what that seven-year-old and that five-year-old felt and absorb that fear and reframe it and process it for myself. So when I get triggered in the present, I try to map it back to an experience so that I can reframe it, that it doesn't affect my present or my future. I think that's such an important point because, yes, we are, we are coming from different places, you know, the, the anxiety disorder versus the trauma. But it really isn't versus in a way. And, and for a lot of people in my community, they coexist, unfortunately. And that's that's I hate that, but it's true. I think. But if you if anybody who's listening to you talk will recognize, OK, for you, you are mapping back to sort of root causes, which we for somebody with, say, panic disorder or agoraphobia, the root cause becomes detached. Now, you never got there. But nonetheless, the mechanics become the same. The mechanics boil down to, OK, let me step back. When you just said, I had to step back and look and say, wait, nothing here is dangerous right now, even though I feel like I have a gun to my head. It's it's experiential learning like you. Act, OK, well, I'm going to have to move through this fear. What can I do now that teaches my brain that I'm not in danger anymore? Whereas somebody who's dealing maybe with no trauma, just panic disorder has to do the exact same thing, except the lesson there is. 
let me teach my brain that there is no there is no danger. I don't have to. There's no mapping for you. It's like, no, there was. But now there's not For the person with panic disorder. It's well, there's just not there was no there is no mapping. But in the end, the mechanism is the same. It's astounding. Like it's absolutely. Yeah. And even now, you know, when things come up and you get that anxious disturbance inside. There's like something triggers, the emotions kick in, then to go to thought. For me, thought kind of takes away the pain and the anxiety. Mm -hmm. So my emotions and my thoughts are having this conversation and I usually attach to it. And it's like, hold on, wait, I got to mediate. Please, everybody just stop for one second. You know, stop fighting with each other. And you get in there and you try to manage the emotions and the thoughts. What I've learned is for me, I pull back in a sense and I let them have that dialogue and I'm watching Breaking Bad. Go ahead, knock yourselves out, beat the crap out of each other for an hour, however long it takes. I'm just going to hang yeah. out with Walter White for a little while until it subsides. Like Attaching to the panic and the fear and the thoughts for me just spirals down to like seven hours of this intense trying to manage the fear where sometimes if I can do it, I'll just pull back and let the fear and the emotions and the thoughts run amok and try to function the best I can with it being there. And it's not always good, you know, oh, the results, but. Oh, and that's you know, okay. And, you know, it's. Yeah. Like, but, but that separation, that air gap, we talk about that in this community, like just making that little bit of a space. We use pauses. We use all kinds of techniques to do that. Like make a space between the fear and you and between the fear and that automatic ingrained reaction that you've always had for you, which was dig in, dig in, dig in, dig in, dig in. You know, but it's the same for somebody who is dealing with panic attacks, who's listening to us right now. You're, you're going to spend the next six hours trying to figure it out, solve it, stop it, you know, wonder why it's happening. Or you could just let it happen like Joe is describing. And in the end, you wind up ahead of the game that way, even though the process of doing that is ugly and scary and nasty and emotional and, and all of those things. But trying to figure it out, you know, puts you deeper in the hole sometimes. It, it, it does. And that's a balance for me to figure out when I really need to go back to traumatic events. Mm -hmm. And now I can tell the difference in the pain and the fear, right? So pain and fear was just kind of one thing for me. Mm -hmm. Now I can kind of differentiate between the pain, something painful and something fearful. So when it's painful, I, I know I need to go back and go to that painful place. When it's fear, I've learned that it's like, just get out of your own way and let it, let them duke it out inside of you. And eventually it's going to run out of energy and power. And, you know, you could just feel more peaceful inside. That's tremendous. I love how you'd separated fear and pain there. And I think for a lot of people listening, I appreciate that because I can't speak to that intelligently. And like, not, I don't know anybody who can like you. Um, Thanks. That's great. Like, when is it time to dig? Well, maybe when there's pain. When is it time to not dig? Maybe when there's just fear. That's that's huge, dude. Uh, it took me <laughs> it took Tremendous. me decades to get to that. But that's yeah. kind of like the new thing I've been on for like the last year because everything, fear and pain was one thing. And I would go down that hole yeah. and never, when I go down the, that path to the past and I don't end up at a destination where there's, resolution it ends yep. up to be way more frustrating so learning the difference between the two has helped a lot what a good conversation i cannot tell you how much i appreciate that we've been talking about doing this for the longest time and then we finally, <laughs> finally did which is right <laughs> so i will wrap everything up you know I'll, I'll be back when we end this and i'll give you the, all joe's links and everything we'll wrap up with what we usually do but where can people find you and we should talk about that thing we're going to try and do in the city too Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, you can find me at joeryan.com on Instagram. I'm at Joe Ryan and my podcast is called It's Not You, It's Your Trauma. Yeah. I think a lot, a lot of the folks listening may already know your podcast, but if you're not, go check it out. And this is how old Joe Ryan is and how long he's been on the internet. He owns <laughs> joeryan.com. He's got 15 million Joe Ryans and he got the name. So there you go. I keep getting yeah. offered, people want to buy it from me all the time. I'm like, yeah, I don't know, man. I'm not selling. So before we before we end it, and I'll come back to do the wrap up afterwards, we should probably talk about that. If you guys enjoy this conversation, and these are conversations, you're like eavesdropping now, essentially. We've had these conversations for years and years and years in the office and parking lots and, and bars and we're at all kinds of different places. But uh, if you want to eavesdrop on a, more of these conversations, we have been trying to plan a live event in New York City. Um, yep. We had it all set up and then COVID exploded again. And that day there was a yeah. blizzard, which turned out and to be... <laughs> and I ha 
and I had long COVID, so I was horizontal yep. for three months, so I wouldn't wouldn't have made it. So yeah, so uh, it's in New York City. It's going to be Drew and I. We're going to be talking trauma and anxiety. I think. What are we shooting for? June. Yeah, I think we're looking for June right now. So if you're following both of us, either of us, I'm sure we'll both make announcements. If it would, it's just a great time, to, I think, to be able to hang out with us and have this conversation in a really informal, small group. Not going to be thousands of people, but we'll give you more details as that comes up. But I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be great. Yeah, me too. And we're also uh, going to be working on a book together. I think we're going to be working on a book together. Yeah. Yep. It's going to so be good. There's a lot of good stuff coming. Yeah. Yeah. So stay tuned. I have a lot of projects, so I don't know how long that book's going to take. But yeah, it's a thing. We're <laughs> Because now everybody's like, when is that book coming out? Like, well, not next year. Yeah, week. all right. Uh, <laughs> we're not really working on a book. <laughs> no, it was a lie. It's a total lie. No, it's totally <laughs> fine. We will work on a book together for sure. But uh, Joe, thanks a bunch, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Drew. Good seeing all you right. again. Guys, stay tuned and I'll wrap it up. Okay, we are back in the studio, meaning at the same desk I was at 15 seconds ago with Joe, as always. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. I really enjoyed doing it. Joe and I are friends for many years, so we talk all the time anyway. I'm going to try and get him on the podcast a little bit more regularly. Uh, but if you want to go find him and all of his stuff, his podcasts and all of his socials, go to joeryan.com and you can check it out. If you go to theanxioustruth.com slash 209, the show notes for this episode will be there. I'll have all of Joe links, Joe's links also if that makes it easier for you. So that is it. That is episode 209. I hope, if nothing else, I hope Joe's story becoming upset, uh, unstuck provides some measure of maybe hope or inspiration or encouragement or motivation because it is just full of that. And uh, take that out of it, if you will. So we are done. You know it's over because music. As always, this is Afterglow by Ben Drake. And if you want to find Ben and his music, you can find him at bendrakemusic.com. Tell him I said hello if you find him. Great guy and a great musician. Uh, I'm going to ask you the same favors that I always do. If you're listening to this podcast on Apple or Spotify or some platform that lets you rate or review the podcast, leave a five-star rating and maybe take a second and write a couple of sentences as a review if you dig the podcast because it helps other people find it. And that's why we're here to try and reach and help as many people as we can. If you're watching on YouTube, then like the video, leave a comment. I promise I will interact with you because I'm enjoying the YouTube comments these days. Subscribe to the channel. Tell your friends all the things. That is it. We are out of here. I will be back next week. I do not know what I'm going to be talking about as usual, but I will be here. And I will leave you by reminding you that this is the way. It's in these feelings that you never show. Yeah, you're doing fine. It's all around you, you can breathe it in. And this is where your story begins. You got the feeling that you're gonna win. Yeah, you're doing fine. Now in the city, yeah, you're living fast. No looking back, I swear to